And Jesus came and spake unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. What's it mean to go into the whole world? If you ask the United Nations, he'll tell you there's 195 nations, countries in the world. How many has Mission Sunday gone into since you've been here at Mesa? Since I've been here, 23 of those 195 nations we have helped send the gospel in those countries. Think about that. Back in 1981, we didn't have this auditorium, and our mission budget was 4% of the contribution because we were planning to build. This year, missions makes up 12.5% of our budget. If you add in next year's budget for Mission Sunday, this congregation will have given $3 million to missions. That's three with how many zeros? Yeah, you got it. So Paul says in Romans chapter 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But then how should they call on him they've not believed? And how should they believe in him they've not heard? And how should they hear without a preacher? And how should they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of those that do what? Preach the glad tidings of good news. With us this morning, we've got a guy from Tennessee. He doesn't speak Arizona English very well. He finished David Lipscomb back in 1970, if you can think back that far. He then went on to get a master's degree from the University of Kentucky. He worked 11 years with Heritage Hospice. He preached 10 years for the Barry's Chapel Church of Christ. He's been the CEO and president of World Christian Broadcasting for, I think, 20 one year has been associated with it. And so we are honored, we're thrilled to have Brother Andy Baker with us. And think about this, 23 years ago they kicked me out of Thailand, and I've tried to go back three times, had our visa to go back, and the communist atheistic country would not let me into that country. But every day, what Andy is going to tell you about, every day, the gospel goes into the nation of Laos because of what he's doing with world Christian broadcasting. Brother Andy, come preach the word, brother. Thank you. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I can't tell you the honor that is mine to sit at your feet and be having an opportunity to sing. Thank you, brother, the way you really led all of us with an opportunity to sing and praise God today. I love coming to the Mesa Church. I placed membership, you remember, two years ago. <laughs> I did. My church attendance is very, very poor. <laughs> I fussed on you last year because I hadn't been back to church in, in a year and I hadn't heard, from any, hadn't heard from all of any of you. And then I got a card from Christina saying mission at church. So I'm looking forward to another card because it'll be a little while before my church attendance will be back here. But it is such an honor to be here. It is such an encouragement to be among these flags and to hear the stories and to know the places you're going into all the world. And Ken, if I could correct, Ken, where'd you go? Ken, if I could correct you, the entire, all those countries are having an opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus because of the Mesa Church. Because we've heard from every one of those countries. We have listeners today in Afghanistan. We have listeners in all parts of the world and you are a part of that and we partner together. I'm sitting here and I realize something about these flags and about our work that would be included in these flags. Do you realize that the sun never sets on the work being done by the Mesa Church of Christ? Let's give that some thought. The sun never sets on ministry that you are a part of over the entire world. We've got some good news to share, do we not? Appreciate your enthusiasm. We've got some good news to share, do we not? Absolutely. Back in the middle of COVID at my house, my wife was really concerned about how much she could get out. She's got a little diabetes issue, a little respiratory issue, so she was staying away from people. 
And she got watching the news. <clears throat> and one day I came in from the office and I hadn't been home long enough to cause any trouble. Can any man in the room identify with what I just you know, said? <laughs> but my wife was a little short with me and I hadn't been there long enough to cause the trouble myself. So after a few moments, I looked at her and I said this, you've been listening to too much NBC, CBS, and CNN news. And she went like this, you know, you're right. Let me tell you something. Our God's sitting on the throne Amen. and his will is being done. Do not be afraid. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because the tomb is still empty. And one day we're going home. And in a lot of questions we might have about life, God's going to give us a few answers. And just like he told Job, some of the stuff you wouldn't understand if I tried to explain it to you. Till then, trust me. So I've come all this way from Nashville, Tennessee to bring you greetings from Nashville, Tennessee, from uh, Majunga, Madagascar, from Anchor Point, Alaska, to remind you not to be afraid because we serve a God who sits on the throne and His will is going to be done. Amen. I hope my sermon of the title intrigued you. What could a whale teach us about missions? Get your Bibles. We're going to have Bible check. Hold them up. And you can hold up those unspiritual cell phones and iPads if you need to. <laughs> But I want us all to turn on one page of Scripture, and I think you know what page we're going to turn to if I mention about a whale. We're going to study the, the, the story about Job. I'm sorry, the, the, the study of the lesson about Jonah. And you're wondering, what in the world, what about this lesson about a whale? The lesson we're going to talk about today is not about a whale. There's a whale in the story. But this is a story about the God of heaven and about me and you being a part of telling the world about Jesus. I want you to take notes this morning. If you're used to doing that, that's wonderful. If you've got a card in the rack in front of you, and I want you to write down at least two things that you're going to learn out of this passage. You're going to learn, and we're going to talk about some attitudes that we need to have in sharing the good news about Jesus. And then we're going to learn some things about God in the book of Jonah. So if you get some, a notepad handy or your iPad or whatever you want to use, I want this story to come off the page. For our young boys and girls in the room, and for really all of us to be reminded, this is a true story. I like your idea about it. I like true stories. This one is true. It's not one that's made up just to kind of thrill us about a, about a whale. This story really did happen. Two places Jesus referred to Jonah. There's another place in 2 Kings where it's mentioned. This is a true story. It's a story about a man in his journey with avoiding something God asked him to do. Would you read me as the story begins in Jonah chapter 1 and beginning in verse 2. God told Jonah, I want you to arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God asked Jonah to go teach the gospel to a city that was filled with sin. If that doesn't describe America, I don't know what is. And there's a parallel with what God wants you and me to do with the good news about Jesus. I want you to go tell this wicked, wicked, wicked city the good news about salvation. Jonah went as far away from God as he could. God told him to go down to, to one city, and Jonah went as far as he could in the other direction. Look with me, if you would, in verse number 3 beginning. But Jonah, I'm reading the King James Bible this morning. Don't know what translation that you may use. But notice in verse number 3 of the passage, but Jonah. And I've done that many times. Have you? I've read where God wanted me to do one thing, and but Andy did something else. Can you identify? Jonah did that. But Jonah, the text says, went and flee into Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with him into Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. I don't know if you're inclined to underline or circle in your Bible. I've got that phrase, he went away from the presence of the Lord circled in my Bible. I'm suggesting for you, not only did he get distance away from God, he walked away from God. He went as far away from God as he thought that he could. I know I'm in, the, in, in a room filled, with, filled up with football fans. Last night I watched, or throughout the day, I watched two or three different games with Jackie yesterday. And I noticed something, when he gets fourth down, that's a pretty serious down, isn't it? You look at this text, it, Jonah is facing fourth down. Look with me, if you would, in verse number two, or verse number three. He went down to Joppa. 
Then he paid the fare and he went down into, he went toward the ship. And then if you look with me in verse number five, he went down into the sides of the ship. Jonah went down, Jonah went down, Jonah went down. It's fourth down. Jonah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do, Jonah? Well, he ran away from the presence of the Lord. They get out there in the boat and a storm comes up. And the mariners that's in the boat know something's up. They know something is up. So they get really, really religious. If you glance with me at verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, those verses, you see the guys on the boat realize something bad's happening here. They've got to come up with a cause. And they draw straws, in essence, and they find out Jonah is the guy that's causing all the trouble. Jonah, what have you done? And Jonah told them, I am running away from God. Chapter 1 of Jonah is Jonah running away from God. I need you to respond to me this morning. Has anybody in the room ever run away from God? Has anybody in there ever chosen to go opposite what God asked you to do? And my hand is up. That's what Jonah did. In chapter 1, Jonah ran away from God. He's in the boat asleep during a storm. The mariner said, something's up. They realized who was causing the problem. And Jonah said, cast me overboard. And they threw him out of the boat. And when they did that, after getting really religious, all these guys, the text says they called on their own God to try to rescue them. And then they threw, threw Jonah overboard, and it got calm. Then something happens in the text. Look with me, if you will, in chapter 1, in verse number 17. Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I don't want to be funny with you. I just try to make the lesson very, very practical. You're taking the truth with Jonah inside a fish. Inside the fish. Don't answer out loud, just give it some thought. You're inside the fish. What do you see? Make it real. Don't answer out of this picture. What do you see? Well, he had a candle in there or a light. You know, he had that in there. What, what, what would you see? What would you smell? What would you hear? Make it real. This thing really did happen. He's in the belly of a fish. Can you imagine being in the side of the belly of a fish for three days? What would you hear? What would you see? What would you smell? This is one of the four things in this text, and we'll talk about all four, that God prepared. God prepared a fish for Jonah. Chapter 2, Jonah runs back toward God. Look with me, if you will, in verse number, chapter 2, verse 1. Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly. Did your eyes right here. Sometimes you've got to get your life, sometimes your life has got to get in a mess before you recognize your need of God. True or false? You aren't ready, let me ask you that again. Sometimes you, you, your life has got to get in a mess before you recognize your need for God. Sometimes you've got to get to a dark, smelly place in your life before you recognize your need of God. Has anybody in the room ever been there? Sometimes you've got to get to a dark, smelly place. Sometimes your life's got to get in a mess before you recognize, you know, I really do need God in my life. Jonah got there. In the, in the belly of the fish, he prays a pretty eloquent prayer. When your life is in a mess, sometimes you pour out your heart. Brother John poured his heart out a few moments ago, didn't he? He poured his heart out about his life. And sometimes when you recognize your need of God, your prayers get sounding pretty good. Look in chapter 2 as we continue to read. Look what he said in verse number 2. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. I don't know where you are in your journey with God. I don't know what's going on in your life. You may be in misery today. Your health may be going down the tubes. Your marriage maybe is going down the tubes. You may be in a dead-end job. You may be taking human anatomy in college right now and it's the hardest class you've ever taken. You may be in a mess. But you can still find God. And in your presence of misery, if you cry out to the Lord, as, as Jonah said, He will hear your prayer. Amen. Don't you give up. Don't give up. Can you always trust God? Let's say that again. Can you always trust God? Yeah. Can you always figure Him out? No. Can you always see all the lessons He wants you to learn? No. Sometimes you've got to take a three-day journey in the belly of a fish to recognize your need of God. 
But if you will pray out in your distress, that Jonah reminds us God's going to hear you. Well, the story gets even better. Continue reading with me. Look in verse number, verse number four. And then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again into your holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me around about me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. Have you ever, have you ever hit bottom? Have you ever rock, hit rock bottom in your life? Have you ever been there? Jonah was there. And as he cried out to the Lord, the Lord heard his cry. Look in verse number 10. The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah on the shore. I don't mean to be funny with you again, but picture how Jonah looked. Picture how Jonah smelt. Jonah's now spit up on the shore. I love what chapter 3, verse 1, how it begins. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. How many in the room are tickled that we serve a God of second chances? Amen. How about third chances? Amen. Fourth chances? Amen. We serve a God who loves us. I mean, He loves us, loves us. He doesn't just love us, He loves us, loves us. And when we show our need of Him, no matter how far down the tubes we've gone, if we will bring our life before Him and ask for His forgiveness, we can be clean again. Uh, Psalm 103 says his, his, his mercies are new every morning. And that's ex excellent news to know. You can put your head on the pillow tonight okay with God. Not because of how good we did it, but because of what He did for us on this cross we've been singing about today. Amen. No matter how bad, I'm glad that we serve a God of second chances. So is Jonah. Because the second thing, the second time Jonah... Go down and preach to Nineveh. Let me call a time out before we get in further in the text. You need to know who these folks are that he's been asked to go teach. They are awful, sinful people. One of the parallels to you and me might be, it would be like God telling you and me to go teach those folks that did 9-11. These folks were that evil. And he told Jonah, go, go, go teach them. And encourage them to repent. You be Jonah right now. Let's just stop for a second. You're Jonah, and you don't like these people anyway. And God said, go teach them. Encourage them to repent. I wonder what's going to happen. You and I enter the story right here. Because we're about to look at some attitudes, and I need to make sure that I don't have, when I think about this Mission Sunday, when I think about telling the world about Jesus, you and I enter the story right here. Because you and I have been commissioned by God to take the gospel literally to the entire world. And what is our attitudes about doing that? I want you to tie your shoelaces tight and lean forward. We're about to be challenged. Are you ready? By the way, you're going to have a test on this today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Are you ready? You and I enter the story right here with Jonah. Chapter 3, verse 1. Word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, the great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. As I read that text, it seems to me that city was so large, it would take you three days to walk through it. Go down to this evil, wicked city, and tell them what I want you to, to, to tell them. Verse number five, or verse number four. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Let me put an Andy Baker paraphrase. Here was his sermon. Turn or burn. That was his message to this evil, wicked city. You either turn or God's going to get you. Now remember, Jonah doesn't like these people anyway. Have you ever heard a preacher before who really got right with you and acted like he enjoyed it? <laughs> you ever had a teacher like that? Jonah's right there wearing those sandals. He doesn't like those folks anyway. His message is turn or burn. But what does Jonah, Jonah want him to do? Burn. He wants them to burn because he doesn't like them anyway. We're in the story now with Jonah. Because God has asked us to teach who? Ken told us a few minutes ago. 
the entire world about Jesus. Let's go back into the story. Look at chapter 3. I want you to go and give them the message. Here was the sermon title. Turn or burn. Turn or burn. Verse number 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For a word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, laid his robe uh, from him, uh, uh, he laid his robe from him, covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And it caused it to be so proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily. What's the king saying? Let's everybody repent. We've got to get our act together. We've got to get our lives where it needs to be or we're going to be punished. And the whole city responded in repentance. Now, as a minister, if I'm preaching at a place and the whole church responded, I'd feel pretty good. I think I, I heard a preacher say one time just a few weeks ago, a friend of mine asked him how, how his sermon went. He said, it was so good I took notes on my own self. If I had a sermon that caused the whole church to respond, I'd, be, I'd, I'd, I'd take notes, notes on my own self with that sermon. Not Jonah. He becomes angry that the whole city responded. We're in the story. How about your attitude and minds about the people of the world, those who need to find out about Jesus? Let's continue reading in the story. The whole city responded. Verse number 10. God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Chapter 1, Jonah ran away from God. Chapter 2, Jonah ran back toward God. In chapter 3, he ran with God. He did what God said to do. Caused the whole city to respond. But look at chapter 4. He gets way ahead of God. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. But... There's that word but again, the transition word. The text says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. The whole city responded, and he gets mad. He doesn't want them to turn. He wants them all to burn. They don't deserve salvation. They don't deserve forgiveness. Do you and I deserve forgiveness? Not in the least. He got so angry. Look how, how bad it got with him. Jonah's running ahead of God, and he's angry at the whole city responding. Look in verse number 2. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was in the country? And therefore I fled before unto Tarsus, for I knew it. Let's stop right there. Right, we're about to read the crux of the matter in Jonah. This is, this is why God gave us the writing of this story, about what we're about to learn next. It came out of Jonah's mouth. Why, why did he go the opposite direction than God asked him to go? Why did he not do what God said? Church, are you ready? Look, look at his answer. Look at his answer in, in verse number 2. He prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in thy country? Therefore, this is why I fled. I fled be, uh, before into Tarsus, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. How many in the room like that picture of God? Boy, that's good news. I knew that you were a God that would forgive. I knew you were long-suffering. I knew that you were a God of, that you were gracious and that you were merciful, that you were slow to anger, and that made Jonah angry. That doesn't make sense, does it? Attitudes kept him from really being tickled to death that the whole city responded. I don't need you to answer me out loud, but how about you and me and our attitudes about some portions of our world? Do we really want the entire world to find out about Jesus? Is that really, do we really want that to happen? Or are there some folks that deserve to be punished? I'm sitting in a, at lunch with eight or ten brothers in Christ the week after 9-11. And one of the guys sitting at that table said this. I'm so angry about what's happened on 9-11. I think we need to go over there and bomb them off the face of the earth. 
Brother Wesley Jones is sitting in at the table, and he very quietly said this. Now, brothers, is that right before or right after we tell him about Jesus? <laughs> End of discussion. You see, if we're not careful, we, we think like Jonah. We don't get excited about the entire world finding out about Jesus. Because of things that have occurred in our past, for some folks, we won't punished. And this picture about God doesn't please me. It makes me, it gets worse. It, keep, keep reading with you. Look, look how bad it really get, or how bad it really got. Look in verse number four. Now, therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. The whole city responds, and he gets, Jonah gets to the man. What does he want to do? Somebody tell me. He wants to die. Just kill me now. I can't handle this. You, you let a whole, you forgave a whole city. I'm so angry. I'm so angry. I could die. Just kill me now. Can't imagine that attitude. That's, that was his prejudice toward these folks that God asked him to go teach. You'll never teach somebody that you hate. You'll never teach somebody that you hate. And if you got some hate in your heart, you need to lay that before the Lord. If you got some prejudice in your heart, James tells us you're not going to make it to heaven. If you got any prejudice, you better deal with that. You better lay that before the Lord. Jonah couldn't handle the mercy and the grace of God. Can you? I mean, you can answer out loud, but that's one of those attitude thought questions. Can you handle a God who is merciful, full of grace, long-suffering, and slow to anger. Can you handle a God like that? Is that good news to anybody in the room? I'm so thankful, but not to Jonah. It gets worse. Read with me continually. Look at verse number five. So Jonah went out of the city. Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. He made him a booth. I'll let you picture what that booth looked like. I have no idea. He found him a place to sit down to watch. And he sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. What's that mean? What's Jonah hoping? Although the whole city responded, what's he hoping they'll do? Change their mind and go back the way they were living. So he just sits under his shelter there and just, he's waiting, he's watching. It gets worse. Look at the next line. Verse number seven, God, pre uh, God prepared a gourd. Verse number six, God prepared a gourd, which is the second thing God prepared. He prepared a fish, now he prepared a gourd. And the gourd, the text says, and he made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Got that picture? A little hot, a little hot there. To keep, Job, uh, to keep Jonah comfortable, God prepared a gourd. Pretty fast growing gourd, isn't it? And now it's over Jonah, and he's in the shade. And how does he feel now? Whew, oh, I love this. Gets worse, look at the next line, verse number seven. God prepared a worm. That's the third thing God prepared. God prepared a worm when the morning arose the next day and it smote the gourd that it withered came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared, that's the fourth thing he prepared, he prepared a, 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 an east hot wind, and Jonah gets really, really mad now. Let's go back to the text. Sun beat upon the head of Jonah, and he fainted, and wished himself to die, and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Church, are you listening to me? Jonah was more concerned about his personal comfort than he was teaching the city about the God of heaven. I gotta look inside my soul and think about my own personal comfort and where that fits in trying to serve God. I need some head nodding, does that make sense? Does that challenge us to the core of our being? Sometimes we're more concerned about comfort. Sometimes we're, and I don't mean to be really, really funny, but it's true. Sometimes I'm more concerned about who's sitting on my pew down at church and getting upset about that than I am those people getting to be there. Sometimes we let a little noise bother us children. Boy, I'm tickled to have noise in church about from children, aren't you? Good night. 
How about your personal comfort? Jonah teaches a very, very valuable lesson. Let's learn three or four things as we close. You've listened great today. What do you learn about Jonah? Jonah ran away from God. Sometimes we've done that. You may be running right now. You may be running away from the lifestyle God has called you to live. You may be dealing with some personal sins. You may be personal challenged today with temptation. And we're, and we're running. And we're running away from God. Sometimes your life, sometimes you've got to end up in a mess. Sometimes you've got to end up in a mess before you recognize your need of God. And if that's where you are, you're at the right place. You may need to come down an aisle and we just pray together about those struggles. Or guess what you can do? You don't need an aisle at all. The truth is you live in the presence of God. Amen. You did not all of a sudden come into the presence of God when you came through the double doors. You live in the presence of God. Is that good news or not? Amen. That's exciting news. In fact, let me even go, let me step on your toes a little bit further. You don't go to church, you are church. Amen. I wish you could go to church. Then what could you do? You could get out of church. <laughs> but if you are church, you never get out of church. And she just smiled, thinking, I'll never get out of church. <laughs> I had a little girl about your age. How old are you? 15. She was probably about 12. She heard me say that in a sermon. She's sitting about right over here. And she heard me say, you never get out of church. And she went, oh. <laughs> but you see, if you are church, you never get out of church. I wouldn't tell that joke in this building because I'm at church. Well, if you, if you are church and you told that joke anywhere, guess where you told it? I didn't hear you. You told it in church. Oh, I can't wear that because I'm going to church. Well, if you are church and you wore it, guess where you wore it? You see, this is serious stuff. We, serve, we live in the presence of God. And no matter what's going on in our walk with God, He's more concerned about where we're headed than where we've been. Because we serve a God who is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and ready to forgive. That's exciting good news. And the entire world needs to know, the entire world needs to know that God loves them. Amen. Let me close like this. God knows your name. He knows you personally. There's nobody like you in all the world. Nobody has your DNA. Nobody has your fingerprints. The Bible even says your name is engraved on God's hand. Did you know God's got a tattoo? And that tattoo is your name. You see, he knows you and me. And he's more concerned about where we're headed than where we've been. Again, I don't know where you are in your journey with God, but I got some good news for you. You ready for the good news? We can serve a God who is slow to anger, quick with his mercy, quick with his grace, ready to forgive 24 seven. Don't need an aisle, you got one today. But if you need to come to the Lord, to be baptized into Jesus. I'll bet you preparations are ready. I'll bet you. Or maybe we need to just pray together about our attitudes, about those that need to know about Jesus. May God help every one of us to the, have the heart of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's go to the world and tell them the news about our best friend in the whole wide world, Jesus Christ. Would you sing with joy right now? Would you sing with enthusiasm? If everything between you and God is okay, just sing with great joy. But if we can't help in any way, let those needs be made known right now. Would you stand together? Let's worship in song. Faithful love for